Hey everyone, welcome to WASD20. My name is Nate, and this is How to Play D&D. So this time on How to Play D&D, we're going to be learning all about how magic works in the game. As with part one and two, I'm not going to try to teach you all the rules for magic. Rather, we're going to be going through a sample session, and along the way we'll be taking pretty frequent pauses to explain how certain things work. If you want the full rules for magic, I definitely recommend you read about it in the magic section here in the player's handbook or in the free basic rules PDF, which you can get online. And as always, I recommend you check out my website, wasd20.net, where you can find the beginner's guide to D&D 5th edition. All right, without further ado, let's get down to the game. All right, so we are going to begin our session today in the bedroom of our main character, our player character, Seanus Briswell. And uh, the DM usually begins a session by setting the scene with some short narration. Uh, I'm going to be putting on a funny DM voice, as I did last time, just so you can tell a little bit better when I'm being the DM and when I'm talking as the player. And I will also be using the red die when I'm talking as the DM, and I'll try to put out the purple die when I am talking in the voice of the player. Alright, so I'll start by setting the scene as the Dungeon Master. You are Seanus Briswell, a young novice wizard who has been working under the great master wizard, Hailrin the Wise. You wake up one morning in the three-story building that comprises your master's study and living quarters to a commotion downstairs. What had you been doing in your bedroom as you prepared for the day? Well, as a wizard, I had probably been walking around, waving my hands, readying my spells for the day, and kind of... Uh, practicing and, and getting in the routine uh, so that I can look good in front of my master. All right, so that is just a little description of what my player was doing, and now it's a good time to pause and talk about spells. So for our purposes, we're mainly going to be looking at how spells work for a wizard, because that's what our character is. But understand it works a little bit differently for each class. Here are the other spellcasting classes, but really any class in D&D could get spells if you work it right. Here's a really helpful way that I look at spells when we talk about preparing spells as our main character has been doing here. What are we talking about? First off, at the bottom of our pyramid here, we have known spells. For a wizard, this is our spell book. This is all the spells that I have listed on my character sheet here. These are my known spells. These are spells I have in my spell book. Uh, for a cleric, this is actually every cleric spell is able to be prepared at the beginning of a day. So a cleric gets to choose from every cleric spell. So it's a little different with every class, so look it up in the book for your specific class that you're wanting to play and read that section on how it works. For us, I have darkened in, I've put a little uh, darkened circle by each of the spells I have chosen to prepare. How did I know how many spells to prepare for the day? Well, that's in the book too. I looked it up and it's wizard level plus intelligence modifier. My wizard level is three, I'm playing a third level character and my intelligence modifier is plus three. So I get six total spells prepared each day. And that's what I've been doing as I go through my room here, going through the motions, looking through my spell book and preparing my spells for the day, selecting which ones I want to have at the ready. Now, I'm not gonna get too much into ritual spells, maybe I'll do a future video on that, but those are spells that I can still cast in a day. It's gonna take some time, and I don't really need to have them prepared in order to cast them. We'll talk about that some other time, perhaps. So we've got our known spells in the spell book. We've got our prepared spells, the ones that we have ready for that day. And then lastly, we have our spell slots. This is like the magical energy we have to cast spells at a certain level. So our spell slots, you can see here, for level one spells, we have four of them. Every time I cast a level one spell, I am going to put a tally mark in the slots expended there. And that is going to help me remember, okay, I have used however many first level spell slots for that day. That resets at a long rest. So this could mean that I cast shield four times or each of these top four once or grease three times a chromatic orb once any combination that gives us four spell slots is what I'm able to do for that day for my level two spells I have two spell slots but I only have one level two spell prepared so that means I could cast mirror image twice or 
I could actually take one of my first level spells, and if the book has instructions for casting it at a higher level, I could do that. So my Chromatic Orb, for example, I could take that and use a level 2 spell slot, and I would probably get to add some extra damage to that spell. I'm casting it at a higher level. And again, the book has instructions for each spell on if it can be cast at a higher level. So what about those cantrips up above? Those are spells that are actually exempt from the regular rules of spell slots and all this. Those are spells that I can cast anytime at will, and that's really nice. That's a nice thing about 5th edition is there are some pretty cool spells that I can cast unlimited. I don't have to worry about spell slots for them. All right, that's enough for now. Let's get back to the gaming table. So the DM has told us that we have awoken to a commotion downstairs. And now that we have prepared our spells and, and finished getting ready for the day, we maybe rush to throw our tunic on. So I simply narrate to the DM that I, I rushed down the stairs. I want to look for anything out of the ordinary. And the DM might say, Firstly, you have noticed that Halrin had been acting strangely as of late. And as you quickly dress and enter the main floor, you find it looks very disheveled. A couple of vials have been tipped over, and a chair appears to have smashed against the wall. Books and papers are strewn across the floor. The smell of burning sulfur permeates the room, and the air looks hazy. Oh boy, I guess I would probably just cautiously go over and see what this material is that is spilled on the ground. It is something very powerful. You do not recognize the substance, but it, it burns your eyes as you get close, and your eyes begin to water. Now, as the player, I would probably not, I don't know, say taste it, <laughs> although you absolutely could do that, or um, touch it. I, I'm probably going to say, I don't know what this is. I cautiously uh, back away. As the player, I would probably move over here, and I want to examine what's on the ground here. Through the haze, you manage to see some uh, writing on the ground that looks like it has been smeared. I want to bend down and examine and see if I can read this writing. Make a history check. Alright, so as we covered in part one, to make an ability check, you roll your d20 and add your relevant modifier. And my six-year-old son Caleb is back from part one and two to roll our very first die. We get a 13, and our history skill is 5. Now this is a knowledge check, and, and some DMs decide not to make knowledge, have you make knowledge checks. They just tell you whether or not your character would know something. But most DMs will have you make a check. And so we got a 13 plus a 5 there is 18. So what can I determine with an 18 history check? Since you do understand Infernal, you recognize this as an ancient form of Infernal language. Uh, it, is, it is a summoning spell of some kind. Hmm, what could this be? All of a sudden you hear the flutter of wings, and an imp appears above you, near the ceiling of the room. Roll initiative. Alright, I'm going to roll initiative for the monster, Caleb's going to roll for the player. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's crazy. All right, so uh, the imp rolls a natural one and the player rolls a natural 20. So the player is gonna be going first, that's for sure, wow. As the player, I think I'm going to actually um, step back a little bit. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, I am going to kind of crouch behind this chair and being a decent, respectable human being, I view an imp as a threat, it is an evil being, and I would not question whether I attack it. So I am going to attack it with uh, a fire bolt. Okay, we get an 18 plus 5, and that is a hit. So I extend my hand, and a bolt of flame flies out and hits the imp for... Nine damage, not bad. All right, imp, let's see. Damage immunities, fire. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> oh no, oh no. I've been working on this video for weeks. Oh. 
please don't make me film it all over again. No. You know what? We're actually going to take this and we're going to use it for good here. We're actually going to use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that the rules ultimately don't matter as much as people having a good time. And are we having a good time here? You better believe it. All right, let's move on. All right, now some of you may be wondering, how on earth did he get those numbers? How did he know what to roll and what to add and all this with the spell, right? And the answer to that is pretty simple. Each spell has a description in the book, and you should look that up. You should learn those, and uh, you should probably write them down somewhere. Uh, now, a couple options and a couple tips I'll give you. One option would be to have your spell sheet here and just write the page numbers here and maybe even bookmark them with a little sticky note in the player's handbook so that you can really quickly look them up when it's not your turn. <laughs> That's a key there. Don't try to look spells up when it's your turn and people are waiting for you. Another option would be to make some little note cards, from some three by five index cards or something. You can just write down your main spells that you know you're gonna be using a lot and write down a little description of them. Speaking of spells you know you're gonna be using a lot, I wrote down on my character sheet my Firebolt spell in the attacks near the names of my weapons. It's an offensive cantrip, and I can see myself using it a lot, so I'm just gonna write it down there. Plus five to hit, and one uh, D10 fire damage. So that's another way to keep track of it. Lastly, Gale Force 9 does make these handy spellbook cards for D&D 5th edition uh, that are really nice to have. They've got clear descriptions, and they're pretty good quality, and uh, you can get them at your local game shop, perhaps, or check online. I'll also put a link to my own review of the cards down in the description below and you can check that out for more info. As for the actual Firebolt spell, you can see here that we have to make a ranged spell attack. That means that we roll our d20 and add our spell attack bonus, which you can see on our character sheet here is plus 5, and that determines if we hit. And if we hit, it's 1d10 fire damage. There are a lot of other offensive spells, like this Flame Strike you can kind of see on the bottom right, in which a player does not have to make a rolled attack. Rather, the enemy actually gets a chance to make a save to avoid some of the damage. All right, now let's get back to it and see how the imp handles this nine fire damage. The imp cries out and shrieks as it has been hit by this firebolt. And all of a sudden, poof, you see it completely disappear. All right, so in this case, as the DM, I have uh, used the imp's ability to become invisible. The imp magically turns invisible until it attacks or until a concentration spell ends. So it's basically, it's casting an invisibility spell. Now, as the player, I, I could choose to keep looking for it uh, and try to find this thing to destroy it, but I, I, it looks like I injured it pretty badly, so um, I am going to ke definitely keep my guard up, but I want to still begin investigating this room and find out what happened here. Where is my master? This destruction does not look like it could have come from this imp alone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to move around here and see what I can see. Uh, do I see anything out of the ordinary as I'm walking around the room here? Make a perception check. Perception with the d20. All right, we're doing some good rolls here today. 17, perception, 17 plus four is 21. You see many things out of place, but in particular, you notice a tapestry with some rubble beneath it, and you feel a slight stirring of the air coming from that direction. Oh, okay, I'm wondering if this is perhaps where the imp has gone, or what is over here, maybe a, a hidden compartment? I am going to stand back here, and I am going to use Mage Hand to slightly lift the tapestry and uh, see if anything is behind it. You do so, and you notice a darkness, an open space behind the tapestry. All right. Um, I am going to grab a torch off the wall here, so I have a torch in one hand and my uh, staff in the other, and I'm going to enter this space. You have to duck your head low to get through this opening, but you, as you do so, you see a narrow uh, staircase. It looks rough-hewn out of the stone going down. You were not aware of any basement to this dwelling before this point. I'm going to cautiously go down the staircase and see if I can hear anything. You do not hear anything at this point. All right, what do I see as I enter this room? You see a makeshift bed and bedroll in the corner, tables with papers and uh, various writings strewn about, some weapons on the ground. 
There's a dirt floor in the room and it overall has a very dingy feel and just a stale and musty smell in the air. All right, I'm gonna approach this table and see what I can see on the table. You see various notes of spells and components, uh, typical wizard writings. Hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and pick up an ax on the ground over here. Uh, this hand ax. You do so. And I'm gonna make my way to the door over here very cautiously. Uh, do I see or hear anything at the door? The door is slightly ajar. I am going to crack it open and try to peek in and see what I can see. Roll a stealth check. Alright, now because I'm trying to be quiet here, I'm going to have to roll a stealth check. Oh man, the good rolls continue. 18 plus 0. <laughs> All right, so we got an 18, and that is going to be good enough. Again, the DC on a check, the difficulty, uh, is going to be up to the DM in many cases. Some of the things, like traps and spells, have a certain set amount. Um, but in a lot of cases, the DM is going to have to decide how difficult it is and set an appropriate DC. As you peer into the room and peek around the corner, you see Hailrin chained to the wall. It looks as if he has been tortured or beaten. You also see a creature that is preparing some what look like instruments of torture. It, this is a humanoid creature with gray skin, dressed in common clothes. Well, sorry my friends, I'm leaving you on a cliffhanger once again, but hopefully you've enjoyed this and you learned some things. In part three, we've covered just the basics of how magic works in the game. But stay tuned for part four because we are going to continue this adventure and we are also going to learn about more rules for magic, as well as talk about some of the other basic rules for D&D, uh, things like advantage and disadvantage and some other stuff. If you liked this one, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Hopefully you found it helpful. And I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. All right, you'll be seeing me again with part four real soon. Take care, everybody.